you can drop the video. So hello and welcome uh, to this first um, mobility panel between the chambers of 2023. Um, this is uh, an exciting roundtable that we're having in cooperation between the French American Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco and Michigan to uh, bridge the gap on the topic of electrifying mobility. Um, we have great speakers today from both sides. Dr. Nadine Malouf from QNOVO and Gonza Gromfort from Valeo. And uh, we'll have uh, an introduction by uh, Bill Rina from uh, LMC Automotive. Uh, Automotive sorry. Um, but I'll let everyone introduce themselves a little bit later. I'll just pass the floor to our moderators of the day. Uh, we've got Marc Comblard from Orsay Consulting and Bertrand Racoteau um, from Ducker Carlyle. Thank you very much for uh, being here today. And uh, I pass the floor to Bertrand. Thank you very much, Anne-Emmanuel, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We are very happy to uh, uh, be here today, discuss with that uh, new series of, uh, of webinar that we're starting between the French American Chambers in uh, San Francisco and uh, Michigan, as, as described by uh, Anne-Emmanuel. So today we're going to discuss uh, bridging the gap between uh, uh, incumbents and, and newcomers in the uh, automotive industry. And uh, we know that there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. So we have three major speakers today with us. Uh, Bill Rina from LMC Automotive, uh, who's going to uh, introduce uh, uh, the, the market perspective, the forecast, and where we are heading to in North America, especially with regards to electrification. Also, we have uh, Gonzague Rem uh, for who's uh, from Valeo, joining us today. And, uh, uh, oh, just sorry. And Nadi Malou from QNOVO uh, also joining us. So I will let everyone just do a quick round of introduction before we start with our, uh, uh, our discussion. So uh, uh, Bill, if you want to uh, start first, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. thanks again, everyone, for having me and LMC Automotive. Once, once again, I'm, I'm Bill Renna, uh, and I'm a director of, of America's Vehicles for Forecast for LMC. I've been with LMC uh, for 10 years now, and I'm really look, looking forward to this event. Thank you, Bill. Nadim, if you want to. Yes, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for the uh, both the San Francisco and the Detroit French American Chamber of Commerce to inviting us. I'm Nadim Malouf. I am the CEO of Kinovo, and when we have the chance, we'll tell you more about who Kinovo is and what we do. But uh, primarily, we're, uh, we build the software layers of the battery management systems for automotive and others. Thank you. And uh, Gonzague from Valeo. Yes, uh, good morning to all, and, and thank you for hosting us. Uh, Gonzague Romfort, I'm leading our customer activity on the US West Coast and with new mobility players for, for Valeo. And bridging the gap from, from Detroit to the Silicon Valley is really at the heart of uh, my mission here, uh, delivering uh, either um, go-to-market partnership or scale-up partnership to the new mobility players. Uh, I look forward for our actions today. Thank you very much. And to moderate that panel today, we have, uh, so myself but, uh, and Marc Amblard. So please, Marc, if you can give a couple of words on yourself. Yeah, thanks, Marc. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I have about you know, over 30 years of experience in the automotive industry. I've been in the Valley, uh, in the Silicon Valley, based in Palo Alto uh, since early 2017. I you know, manage also consulting, which is an advisory um, uh, entity. It's just me advising uh, uh, so incumbents, uh, so OEMs, T1 suppliers, engineering companies, and the like, as well as startups across the mobility space. Uh, so uh, electrification is clearly at the heart of what I deal with uh, alongside the time is driving uh, new mobility solutions um, and software defined vehicles and more. So great to be with everyone today. Thank you, Mark. And I'm Bertrand Akoto. I'm the president of the French American Chamber of, Chum of Commerce Michigan chapter, uh, also with 23 years of uh, automotive experience with uh, tier one, tier two suppliers, OEMs and forecasting and uh, market analysis uh, for the last 15 years. I'm based here in Detroit. And uh, so our program today is going to be uh, a presentation of the, uh, the, the market from uh, LMC Automotive. Belrina is going to cover that before we jump into the, the discussion uh, with the panelists. And uh, for 45 minutes, we're going to have a discussion so we can open then after on a Q&A session for any topic that you would like to dig into or get more 
uh, crisp information from uh, from our uh, our respondents. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, without further ado, Bill, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, thanks again for having me, and let me share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bertrand asked, asked me to give an out outlook of our North American light vehicle um, uh, production and, and sales forecast. And and this is certainly a, a, an, an uncertain time in the industry, not not only in North America, but also glo globally. Uh, we've had uh, almost three years of layered disruption, start, start, starting with the uh, with the pandemic. And then it led into the chip crisis and other uh, supply chain issues. And then last year, of course, we had rising inflation uh, uh, coupled with rising interest rates, along with the war in U U Ukraine, which all led us kind of to where, where we are now uh, with uh, recessions looming and the economy uncertain. And and first, I'm going to start out by looking at the the economy uh, for North America uh, after a pullback in economic growth during the pandemic, and and subsequent recovery in 2021. The economy is in North America pulled back in in 2022, hampered by elevation uh, elevated inflation levels, and increased interest rates to uh, combat it, uh, all, all which led to headwinds against ve vehicle sales, uh, which should continue into this year. In 2023, our partner at, at Oxford Economics sees flat to net negative growth in the region, uh, with the U.S. and Canada expected to see a recession, with Canada possibly already in one. Uh, in the U.S., we see G GDP growth as flat and with sluggishness expected uh, in Q1 and a recessionary environment uh, in Q2 and Q3. And the latest guide guidance from the Fed is that they will continue to increase interest rates uh, to combat inflation. And we expect a 25 basis uh, increase coming up uh, next week. Uh, Mexico, uh, economy is fragile, but we do see growth for the year, although a, uh, a mild recession in the U.S. Uh, is expected to weigh on the economy. In Canada, again, we may, uh, they may already be in a recession, and that is expected to last through, through the year as high inflation and interest rates uh, have consumers cutting back on spending. And now digging into our, into our, uh, uh, North America light vehicle sales for forecast. Uh, if we look back in 2020, we obviously had a pull pullback uh, in the region due due to the due to the pandemic. Uh, and then in 2021, we did see uh, some recovery, but not to potential. And that was mainly due due to the semiconductor shortage and other part shortages weighing in on in inventory. Uh, and because of that, we did see a pullback. Uh, uh, last year, uh, where uh, North America sales fell fell back considerably, the lowest level since since 2011. Uh, although we did see some slight growth in Mexico, mainly due because they're, they're they have stronger fleet sales there, and also their inventory wasn't as impacted much by the uh, semiconductor shortage. Uh, this this year, uh, uh, amidst although improving an inventory environment, uh, but that is but there's headwinds uh, with higher incentives, high, higher interest rates, uh, higher vehicle prices that are weighing in on sales. But we should see s overall sales increase in the region due to uh, a better in inventory uh, situation. Uh, and as the economy improves in 2024 and 2025, uh, with lower expected interest rates and easing vehicle prices, we do see overall improvement in the region. Uh, look, looking at uh, the U.S. light light vehicle uh, forecast specifically, uh, again, there was a pullback of 8% uh, last year 
that was mainly due to lack of inventory, higher vehicle prices and rising interest rates. Again, we see easing uh, uh, this year in inventory levels or improving inventory levels, uh, uh, but that is combated against uh, higher vehicle transaction prices uh, and higher interest rates. Although we have seen some easing in transaction prices as overall inventory has increased and lower vehicle, uh, lower price vehicle mar uh, models are, are available in the market. But we reached a high in December of four, $47,000 for average transaction prices. Uh, and the 46,000 is still keeping many folks uh, out of the market. Uh, uh, with the higher interest rates and inflation, higher vehicle prices, we have seen a reduction in in uh, in, in in retail sales, and that has given manufacturers an opportunity as they as as they improve inventory uh, to increase uh, their overall fleet uh, uh, sales, which was neglected uh, during the pandemic. And, and if we take a clo closer look at our U.S. Uh, BEV demand out outlook, uh, lo lo looking back in 2018, overall BEV, BEV sales were less, were around 1% of the market. Uh, we did see, uh, as models have come online, uh, we have seen that, we did see that improve in 2022 to roughly 5.5%. Uh, Obviously, most most of that that was Tesla, uh, uh, with uh, the Mustang Mach E also uh, contributing uh, significantly. Uh, we do see improvement uh, as new vehicles come come online, uh, uh, and the IRA uh, tax incentives are implemented. Uh, and by the end of our for forecast horizon, we see uh, overall uh, Bev sales in the U.S. reaching nearly 40% uh, of the market again by, by 2030. And, and then as we transition into uh, a North American light vehicle production, uh, again in 2020, 20, in 2020 we did see a, a significant reduction in North, North, North America production due, due to the pandemic and the subsequent uh, shutdowns due to social distancing. Uh, we thought there was gonna be improvement in 2021, but obviously the chip shortage took a big bit bite into that, which you know reduced the manufacturer's ability to, to produce vehicles. Last year, although there was improvement in the amount of disruptions uh, due to the semiconductor shortage and other parts related short shortages, uh, uh, we did see an improvement. Uh, it's grew it grew 993 percent to over 14 million, and and we continue to see improve, improvement this year. So far through fe February, uh, North North America light vehicle production is up 10 percent, and and we see that as as uh, as uh, uh, the semiconductor shortage situation improves and other parts related shortages improve, we should see. Uh, an improvement in overall in overall production. Uh, we are seeing some some uh, uh, pressure due to some su supply side uh, down down downside where where uh, or or demand side where where more uh, vehicles have higher in, in, in inventory levels and manufacturers are are needing to cut back uh, like the Chevrolet Silverado and GMC uh, Sierra. Our midterm for, forecast could get a boost from from BEB conversion, but but uh, but raw material scarcity and or chip shortage could uh, undermine afford, affordability uh, and consumer appeal. So there could be some opposing forces there. And then just touching quick quickly on in, in, in inventory, which has been a, a headwind against demand. We do see overall. Uh, light vehicle inventory in the U.S. improving. Uh, at the end of February, it was over 1.7 million units, uh, which improved slightly on on uh, on January's num number. Uh, it's still it's, it's still significantly down uh, uh, from from prior to the pandemic. However. Uh, 
And, and then if we look at uh, North America pat capacity, and this is the ability to to uh, uh, produce light vehicles in the region, uh, we do see it growing uh, significantly uh, in North, North America, particularly in the U.S., where in 2021, it was 14.2 million units, and in 2030, uh, we expect it to be uh, 17.6 million units. Uh, most of that growth, uh, uh, as you can see on the chart on the, re on, on the right, is going to uh, the Southeast with some Midwest uh, uh, investment as well. And you also see some, uh, uh, some going in the South, and that's mainly uh, uh, Tesla with their Austin plant. Uh, and we do see some some growth in Mexico uh, as well with the uh, with the Tesla plant. They're planned planned also. Uh, most of this growth in capacity is due to uh, new uh, Bev capacity, uh, which is growing to roughly 10.2 million units and counting. Uh, especially due to the in, in, Inflation Reduction Act, Reduction Act, which is incentivizing uh, 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 capacity, BEV capacity uh, in the U.S. Uh, I've been asked to kind of touch on, you know, what would happen if if there was an unwinding of the Inflation Reduction Act due to the change of a uh, uh, president to a uh, uh, to a Republican or a conservative, uh, uh, we we think you know there was plenty of investment uh, prior to the Inflation Reduction Act, which was signed in August of of last year. Uh, we had you know Ford investing in their Stan Tennessee plant, uh, uh, which which was a, which was a red state. Uh, we had significant investment in in South Carolina. I previously mentioned Texas. Uh, 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 so, so we don't think there would be, there's going to be a significant, uh, un, unwinding of that, uh, of, of that, that investment because the manufacturers, uh, are still going to want to build where, where they sell, uh, and the local market in North America is expected to be strong. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, enhances, uh, it with more, uh, powertrain replacement parts uh, that which there wasn't a dire uh, rush for prior to the Inflation Reduction Act signing. Uh, and it is also trying to restrict the number of jobs lost in the great transition from 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 ice to to BEV, uh, which is likely to happen super sooner or later anyways, uh, since it takes fewer parts to make an EV powertrain than ice. And then lo looking at our North America long-term forecast for BEVs, as you could see, you know, we were right around uh, 800,000 units of BEV production in 2022 uh, with around 22 models or so uh, being produced here in the region. We see that growing significantly, uh, especially starting this year uh, uh, with new models coming online. Uh, uh, and then it growing to roughly uh, almost 7 million units by the end of our four forecast horizon and then over 160 models uh, uh, being produced in the region. Obviously, there's some risks to those models uh, uh, because some are your startup dev manufacturers that, that may not all ultimately come into to fruition as, as competition increases. So with that, I hope you enjoyed the brief overview of, of our outlook for North, North America sales and production. I look forward to uh, participating in the panel. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. That was a very interesting and, uh, and uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, one big thing I, I, I remarked is that we're jumping to 6.4 million uh, BEVs by 2030 in your forecast. And, uh, also, uh, an increase in the, in the production of uh, jumping from 1 million to almost 10 million, I mean, over 10 million vehicles that can be produced in North America, probably thanks to the IRA, but not only. So, I, I mean, 160 BEVs launched in this forecast period that requires a lot of innovation, lots of R&D, uh, and uh, surely this is one thing that I'm sure our two panelists, I mean, our three panelists are going to be uh, 
giving us a lot of insight and, and experience feedback on, on what are those challenges, not only towards the vehicles themselves, but talking between companies that are coming from different horizons and, and different uh, technology backgrounds. So maybe we can we can start uh, quickly with uh, uh, Nadim, if you if you will just uh, tell us as you are willing to uh, you, you are sorry working on battery management systems uh, with different companies and, and tier suppliers, but also probably uh, car makers. What, what is the biggest challenge you've seen lately in your field of, of, of expertise uh, working towards the, uh, the mobility industry? Yes, thank you, uh, Bertrand. So yeah, for us, uh, I would say we've seen tremendous changes over the last couple of years, specifically since 2020, perhaps. We've seen a significant sentiment, change in sentiment across the uh, vehicle makers. So our customers, we sell our solutions directly to the vehicle makers, to the OEMs, uh, globally, not only in North America, but also Europe and Asia. And we've seen a significant change in sentiment in the last couple of years. Uh, certainly Europe for many years had been on the bandwagon of EVs and pushing quite hard, and Asia kind of caught up fairly rapidly. But the US, North America was, was lagging behind. And that's the sentiment that I'm talking about. That was a significant change where Finally, you could see North America realizing we need to change. Obviously, Tesla, the, the Tesla factor was huge. And that changed the nature of the conversation that we used to have with the OEMs. For many years, probably since 2010 when we got founded, we've been having conversations with the OEMs at various levels. And invariably, the conversation was leading to one of two answers. Well, it's too early. Come back later. We don't need that yet. Or you know, we know how to do it ourselves, which both proved over time to be incorrect. So the challenges were always about how do you get the OEM to be first realizing that the macroeconomic forces on EV adoption were, were happening, they were not going to be delayed. And second, how do you convince the OEM to realize that we as a Silicon Valley company can bring solutions that are beneficial to them and to the ecosystem and somewhat relinquish, perhaps abandon a long cherished thought within Detroit that those big guys can do everything themselves. And, and perhaps over time, they may have the capability of doing everything themselves. But as we've seen, the time has crunched all those capabilities. Uh, the, the EV makers realize that they need to now get models out in a very short period of time. And so that was something that was beneficial in the conversations that we have with them. Now, Gonzag, you, you, you thank, thank you, Nadim. Gonzag, you, you're looking at this from a different perspective. Novarius have been investing in this space for quite some time, uh, focusing especially on, on motors and, and power electronics, not that much on the battery side, even though you probably some, have some interest there. But from your standpoint, what are, you know, as we are starting to see, you know, really significant growth, what are the key challenges as, as you are, you know, keep participating in this space, but also opportunities as, as things develop and maybe the OEMs are taking a different role um, with vertical integration. What's your take on that? I think, thank you for, for introducing. Uh, um, you write in the command that beyond the electric chain that everyone is immediately thinking uh, at, uh, this has this change has a huge impact on the entire vehicle itself. Uh, I will I will take a few examples, um, starting with the thermal chain. So the thermal chain is what is uh, hitting the, the the vehicle and delivering comfort to the driver. And so far uh, with ICE, we could enjoy kind of free heat, right? You had this ICE delivering heat to the to the to the cabin, and uh, the move to electric vehicle is um, is pushing the entire industry to entirely redesign. This, uh, this thermal chain introducing new components like the heat pump, but also new, new challenges. The battery need to be heated at start to work in uh, optimal conditions. The battery also need to be cooled on while operating to work at uh, optimal conditions. So I think our challenge is to bring all those solutions timely, on time uh, and at scale. And I think this is where our mission is the, at Valio is to accompany our customers to, to deliver those new technology on time and at scale to, to reach the, the millions of vehicles Bill was highlighting. Thank you, Gonzague. So 
while while driving those those changes in the in, in the architecture of the vehicle and adopting also systems that are coming from uh, not just uh, um, Detroit uh, operators but also newcomers, so uh, how do you make that converging between I mean the, the experience and the knowledge of the of the vehicle that you have on the one hand and and companies like uh, Cunovo and and maybe Nadim also you can give us some some feedback here on what uh, what are the challenges in some ways that on very specific technical aspects where the experience of the incumbents is necessary to make to integrate better your solution as a, 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 a true innovation in the architecture of the vehicle it's, and it's probably where we see a lot of needs for that uh, and probably a lot of challenges yeah i'm happy to start um Gonzalo, go ahead if you want to i'm, I'm okay the way really uh, okay as i just to Indeed, uh, we the, we have been preparing ourselves for a long time, as as was uh, as mentioned by Mark. So we have been starting stop start uh, in the year 2004. We have launched our joint venture with CMATES on high voltage in 2016. So we have been preparing ourselves for for a long time, and we are ready for the transition. So to the question one, are we able to make it uh, on our side? We would answer yes, but to the question. It, would it be the smartest way? Would it be the fastest way? I'm definitely convinced that the, this is not the, 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 the way to do it and that the, the era is an era of collaborative approach simply because there is much to do and, and uh, this, we need this collaborative engineering approach to be able to take the best where it is and to embed solutions together into vehicles. And, and this is where um, working together with um, uh, new players that are agile with their with their newness can can bring uh, speed and uh, fast uh, access to market for the new technology. And Nadim, you you may complement. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, I mean that's wonderful. Uh, we, we love uh, how the the whole ecosystem has changed in terms of the sentiment. So so perhaps it may be beneficial if I were to give the audience a very brief introduction as to what we make. And then use it to to lead into answering the question uh, Bertrand that you posed. Uh, so so we work in the battery space. We don't make batteries. We make the intelligence around the batteries. So expanding the envelope of the batteries, whether it's fast charging, better safety, more performance, more driving range, more longevity, etc. And that is implemented as a software that is embedded in the vehicle. So it actually sits in the ECU or the battery management system. And by definition. It means that we have to work collaboratively with the OEMs, in particular the OEMs, the vehicle makers themselves, because we do have uh, essentially a component of integration. Now, we understand it very well, but ultimately it does require that the OEM and us work very closely to put our solutions directly in the BMS ECU. That by itself means that there has to be some degree of cooperation between us and the OEM. Now, what are the observations that we've made? We've seen that certainly the OEM historically thought that they had all the skill sets in house when it came to the battery issues. And over time, they realized that wasn't true anymore. In particular, that was amplified by a certain trust that the OEMs had in the battery vendors, uh, the big names, you know, the LGs and the Samsungs and what have you. Right? And then over the last couple of years, with the safety issues becoming more prominent, car fires, recalls, there's tremendous tension today between the vehicle makers and the established supply chain on the battery side. And that created opportunities for companies like us to step in and sort of say, hey, look, we can bring you knowledge and experience that you don't necessarily have access to and the agility to react quickly. So that was very beneficial in our respect to address what historically was a big problem. I mean, the big problem was that the car makers for the last 50 or 75 years, had a well-established supply chain. They know how to go from where they are to the tier ones, to the tier twos, the processes, the relationships are well-established. And now it's all being scrambled. Scrambled because the nature of the design of the vehicle is changing, but also changing because Tesla is putting tremendous pressure on a timeline and, and the supply chain. And that's forcing the vehicle makers to rethink the supply chain and creating opportunities. That same pressure also is moving down the, 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 the chain to tier ones. You know, whether it's Vallejo, Borg Warner, of course, we have a very close relationship with them. All of those now are sort of rethinking their strategies to electrify 
and realizing that the collaboration with companies like us in that space become important synergistic for both companies in the sense that for a company our size small company we can certainly benefit a lot from learning how to scale to become a credible supplier to the automotive industry you don't simply come in with a cool technology idea or cool product and sort of say let me sell that to 100 million cars it doesn't work that easily and so there's a certain amount of hand holding that the big companies can help us as we scale in return the collaboration viewed by the car makers or the tier ones or the tier twos is one where they can learn from new technologies, new innovation, new agility, and new solutions that sort of transcend the historical path. The EV is a very different beast. Just because you've been building cars for the last 100 years does not mean you know how to build EVs now going forward. And there's a lot of nuances. And that's where the collaboration comes important, becomes really crucial. How can we, as a Silicon Valley company with our own historical luggage and our own culture work with the Detroit company with its own historical luggage and its own culture. I mean, it, 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 I fully raise what you're saying at the same time coming back. You know, I've been in the industry since the late, you know, starting the industry in 1987. So it's been some time. It ages me, but so be it. Uh, the, the the industry has established some culture. You know, it doesn't like risk. It doesn't ask, you know, it does want to take its own pace. Speed is not necessarily, you know, the, the name of the game. At the same time, obviously, startups are coming from a very different angle, ready to take risk, wanting to take to, to, to take risk, to, sorry, to go fast, ready to fail and, and start again from a different venture point. And this is very different from what the, the, from the way the incumbents, whether it be you know an, an OEM or a tier one supplier. Uh, maybe I'll take the, this question to Gonzai. I'd love to, to hear you know, your point as well and Nadim after that. But uh, you, Gonzai, is looking from the, from the, the incumbent. Uh, how do you deal with a start that you know, that is necessary in this ecosystem, as, as as Nadim highlighted, to bring new ideas, to bring again you know new ways to you know business models, technologies, speed, and all that? How do you handle with that uh, at, at a company like Valio and uh, to, to to get because you need you need those companies? Yeah, for us there is there is no um, the question is 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 nowhere an issue in the sense uh, the change is there, the change is happening. So we have a tremendous trend in the all our product portfolio. And as I said, we have, we have started early and we are now um, integrating brand entire product ranges into vehicles. And I think at the heat pump, I think at Kulik plates that, that, that are entire product that were not existing. If we look at the thermal chain, the content per car is multiplied by 2.5 for um, a value portfolio. If we look at the, at the electric, a power train, the, the, the scale is even bigger. So it means we already have in our portfolio um, huge activity to bring those new products to the markets uh, and to extend our portfolio and the associated footprints. So it means when on a certain uh, niche, there is a smart solution available for us, we rather view it as a, as a way to gain the time to market. and. We are building ourselves a platform to be ready made available as platform, which means we have a mechatronic platform for the mechatronic product. We have a software platform for the software product. And, and uh, if the, the architecture itself allows us to embed into our platform a niche solution and to gain both time and, uh, and uh, as they say, and the product value. So we look, I think we view, we, we can be, we are both in the situation of scale-up partner and go-to-market partner, which are not contradictory at all. And Nadim, from your standpoint, I mean, you, you've been working with OEMs, uh, I mean, for, with mostly OEMs, but I guess to some extent as well with, with the T1 supplies you mentioned, Borgwana. How do you, you know, you've been at it for what, 12 years now, as you said, starting in 2010. How, how do you, have you how does that experience evolve over time you know in, in terms of relationship with incumbents and how do you maybe hold your hands hold their hands and and you know, make it happen together yeah so i think uh, uh first let me just say that the automotive relationships for us didn't happen until probably around 2016 time frame 2017 you know for the time period before that the automotive folks still were of the mind that electrification wasn't going to happen until 2030. 
And so we kind of joke internally within a company that we owe some of our existence to Tesla. If Tesla didn't really accelerate their growth in the last several years, we probably would still be selling smartphones today. Uh, so we kind of earned a living for many years in the smartphone space. And it also turned out to be a very beneficial experience for us to learn how to scale in a very tough industry and to also scale across massive volumes at a very, very rapid pace. The, the pace of which the consumer electronics industry moves is infinitely faster than the automotive for, for, for its own separate reasons. Uh, so, but that helped us establish a certain credibility when we began engaging with the automotive folks around 2016, 2017, we didn't come as a typical startup company with just some ideas and PowerPoint presentations. We had proof points, uh, we had existence, we had demonstration of capabilities, and that earned us the right to sort of not just have conversations in the lobby, we got to be in the first conference room down the hall as we began talking to the, o the OEMs. Uh, additionally, things that happened in the consumer space began to map out in the automotive space. For example, safety. You know, we, uh, we were very engaged and, and fully aware of the safety issues when it comes to the batteries. Uh, the Samsung Note 7 disaster, for example, in 2016 was is, is a traumatic point in the consumer industry. And we learned a lot from it and we were apply, applied those learnings into the automotive and that proved to be very beneficial, of course, in the last couple of years. So I think th th that helped sort of create that credibility. And then over time, of course, as we began engaging with the OEMs, the data spoke for itself. They began to see the results. They began to sort of see, wow, okay. Then realize that you could do so much, whether it's fast charging or more driving range, all the attributes that we, we give our customers. And the data speaks for itself, as I said. But I want to also add something else to what Gonzag said. We often think about the transformation in the automotive industry as being electrification being one, of course, autonomy kind of being another aspect of it. And that is true, but it's actually incomplete. The other massive transformation that's taken place is moving from hardware to software. For 75 years, the car makers, the tier ones were so just absolutely excelled at building hardware. They were able to monetize every point of efficiency. They were able to build amazing infrastructures and, and supply chains. And now we're moving to software. And to a large extent, those skill sets don't exist. And so that's where we also come in and, and, and have convinced our customers and our partners that we understand software, not only the battery, but the software and the intersection of the two, the software defined batteries for the lack of a better word is where we kind of shine and that really made us a very attractive partner to our customers and, our, and, and some of the tier ones. Thank you, Nadim. Thank you, Gonzag. I, I think you touched, Nadim, to something, and, and I think also in, in one side words about engineering approach and so on. We're moving a lot from product and engineering to service and, and user experience, and that's also a major shift that is asking a lot on the cultural aspects of companies gaining different flexibilities. And I think it, it does uh, it does apply both to incumbents and, and, and newcomers or startups that incumbents need to gain agility in their cultures while uh, uh, sorry, incumbents need to gain that, that agility while newcomers need to gain probably at some point a little more uh, robustness in the process instead of having a fast changing always uh, and, and restarting uh, experiences for, for the startup. So uh, how does this operate on, on both of your sides to try to have those cultural convergence towards, I mean, working together? Because talking about the system is probably easier than talking about how you get to that system through your own organization. So, uh, and, and maybe Gonzaga, I don't know if you want to start with, with that or, or Nadim, but maybe Gonzaga, if you can give us what changes this has brought or what's the transformation that you see within your company towards those, maybe not just the electrification, but also the perspective on how the vehicle perception is changing in the market. Yes, and, uh, and this software move is appearing now and indeed I, I started already um, we so focus at value on our two pillars, electrification and uh, ADAS, which are two uh, both massive, uh, which were two massive software um, investments. And the first mindset uh, change uh, comparing to standard automotive is this move from a product development to a platform development, which has as a, as a major impact that uh, you don't sell a, um, a product that is finished and frozen. You pro your product is entering an area that will permanently evolve and 
you need to secure that while you allow your product to evolve over time, you'll be able to get flash over the air in your car and to get the, the, the latest post features and platform adaptation. You also need, and this is your duty, to maintain the same level of safety and reliability. And this is the mix of posts that will make the success. And, and this is where uh, from the, the, the speed from other, other industries, uh, the key is to maintain the success, maintaining the high level of reliability and, and safety in those updates. And, and uh, we believe this is your core strength at value to be able to bring in this car a platform that will be evolutive and that will allow to um, embed the, the future features. I take the, the example of the, the valet parking we are developing. So it's, it's a system for which the vehicle will be compatible, uh, feature ready, but feature not implemented yet. The implementation will come over time and will be available in the library. And, and the, this mindset of, um, of a vehicle that can evaluate is the major shift in, our, in, in the industry, of course. And then and, and, uh, is allowing also to open many new doors in terms of uh, providing additional features to your vehicle over time. Yeah, so let me see if I can add some color in terms of how we engage with the customer. And then perhaps that would give the audience a bit of a sense of how we begin to bridge the cultural differences. And so often we, you know, if I go back a few years, we would approach a customer and sort of say, look, you know, Talk to us because we can give you something great. And often that conversation seems to coalesce around fast charging. Today, fast charging is one of the most important attributes of an electric vehicle. And we we you know we see more models coming up next year with that. But sort of 20, 20 minute charge time is something that we deliver to our customers without degrading the battery. And so when we talk to the customer, the OEMs and they go, Well, I don't believe you. Uh, it's just Fire in the sky stuff that can't be possible. You know, we talked to the battery vendors and they said they can't do it. And we say, sure, of course, you have every right to believe what you want. Why don't you just test us? Let, let us run some tests and that will let us show you. And that, you know, after some time, they, they run the test and they see that actually it is indeed correct. And then it's the relationship changes drastically at that point in time. It goes from, all right, this is some kind of a Silicon Valley idea that was we thought was some kind of a snake oil to this is real and how do we transition on both sides to taking it from an idea to an implementation in a vehicle and it's not only just about the software and the battery knowledge but also how do you work the organization on their side those customers are behemoth companies i mean they're infinitely bigger than we are and therefore there are mazes and processes and different layers of authorizations and different layers of approval and different stakeholders. You got engineering. You got advanced engineering. You got you got production. You got marketing. You've got uh, procurement, and all of those have to be brought in. And so, for us, part of the cultural adaptation has been about how do we navigate those complex organizations. I mean, I think you know, I would love for Gonzac sort of give me draw me a map of Vallejo and all the maze at Vallejo and say, okay, if you talk to all those folks in there, then we can be all set in the car. It's not as easy because that's sort of every company is different. And, and, and it, the geography also changes in the way a Korean company operates is vastly different than the way Detroit company operates, vastly different than the way European company operates, et cetera. And just because they may have a headquarter in North America, it does not mean that the company's culture is necessarily North American. And so, yes, another layer of adaptation that we have to have. And the way we address it is by having people on the ground near the OEMs, you know, offices in Europe, offices in Detroit, in Korea, et cetera, and then sort of see how do we get to develop those relationships with the, not only with the company, but also with the individuals to understand their processes, their expectations, and also understand who are our champions. And perhaps for a company our size, the number one priority for us is to understand who are the champions in, within those companies because we can never expect to understand that behemoth out there if we don't have a guide, one or two really crucial persons who can help us navigate the complexity. Uh, it's, it, I like I mean, the, the, the what, one recommendation you have. If we can just take, take some, some you know, zoom out a bit, 
you, you've been in it for some time. You've been the working in the auto industry since 2016, you've indicated earlier, and then with other industries prior to that. Um, yes, the, the, you know, the, the two, the incumbent space and the startup space are different in terms of culture, in terms of operational speed, appetite for risk, and many other things, and complexity of organization and the like. Can you maybe just to, just to make it more concrete, give us an example, Nadim, uh, uh, first, uh, of what has been a successful uh, partnership and how, you know, how it came about and maybe draw from that recommendation possibly to other stops that are, you know, don't have their level of experience that you have. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the ones I can talk about, the one public, of course, you know, I can't talk about some of our customers, but the two public instances uh, that I can share are Borg Warner and NXP. And so the tier one and tier two, <clears throat> they're not our customers, but they are our very close partners. And Borg Warner has been a relationship that's been in the work probably for many years. I think we began talking to Borg Warner. It was a literally with just serendipitous discussion at one of the analyst conferences. And, and, and we kind of came across individuals at Borg Warner. Initially, it was Delphi and Borg Warner who, who really kind of understood the transformation of EVs and the impact on, on the tier ones. But I think I would say at the time, it was limited to maybe one or two individuals. It wasn't really so widespread within the organization. But that proved to be an important beachhead. If the, how do we really begin to have the conversations? How do we get to know each other more? How do we provide to them a, a more context of why we're the most competent? And of course, that led them on their side to do their diligence. And this is not a, it's not a VC investment where let me go run two weeks of diligence on you and I'm done. This is years of developing the relationship. Perhaps, you know, when we began talking to Borg Warner around in the 2017, 2018 timeframe, we didn't, they didn't come in and invest in us until 2021. So, you know, three years of, of dialogue, of discussions, of getting to know each other, of understanding uh, the timing that matters. So that proved to be a very beneficial one. And we have a close relationship with them right now. I won't go through the details, but we helped them on the technology side, on the software side, on the battery side. And they help us, you know, I think to use a, perhaps a crude term, company our size to grow out of diapers. You know, if, if we want to be a supplier to the automotive industry, we need to be a credible supplier in terms of processes, products, people, presence, et cetera. And that's sort of where we can, they, they help us quite a bit. On the NXP side, it's a tier two supplier. So they supply silicon. So it's not an investment relationship, but it's a very close partnership where we have both recognized that the confluence of our software and their hardware can become a powerhouse in terms of recommending to the car makers, especially in Asia, where you may not have the depth of, say, a GM or perhaps a VW, where you have smaller OEMs who are looking for guidance. And therefore, they don't want to go and monkey with all the details. And we would come in and sort of say, hey, if you take NXP plus Kinova software, put them together, you can be up and running fairly quickly, for example, in two wheelers in, in Asia. So that's sort of examples where we have a common vision, we've established common vision, but we've been working on the relationship for quite some time to establish trust. I mean, I can't really overemphasize the value of trust between the individuals to drive the common vision within the companies. It goes like what, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, you, you've, you know, you've been in the Valley for about a year now, you've, you know, gained experience with startup probably in, in, in Europe before that. You know, you have examples of successful partnership with startups and, and what would be a recommendation uh, maybe to startups actually rather than to other T1 suppliers to make for a successful partnership? Yeah, the, the um, successful example that I, uh, that come immediately to my mind in the, um, in the joint development for LIDAR with uh, IBO. So IBO back in the year 2008, 2009. So it's, it's a while ago, LIDAR was not the hot topic that it is today. Um, they had they had this uh, industrial lidar design and wanted to go automotive without being um, at, at, the, at the scale to reach automotive. So we enter a partnership to bring their design into an automotive design, and which would allow ultimately to bring this sensor at scale and to to move from a small volume, few hundred samples a year to hundred of thousand sensors you need to closely work both on the design to make it manufacturable at scale. And, and this partnership, um, I mean, is this is the, the root of the success we have in LiDAR being today the, the sole uh, supplier delivering automotive LiDAR in the field. With, with this uh, 
partnership at the start with a specific technology that that required adaptation to to the automotive world. Uh, so this is an example. We have also other examples um, in equity. This was not the case of, of this one. This was a, um, a license shem. But my main message is there is. I think there is no one unique way, um, and we need to stay pragmatic. And this, even the one solution today, may not be the, the same tomorrow in three to four years when the when the relationship has evolved. So. The, the, focus, the focus, there is no reason to focus on equity. It can be, it can very well be a go-to market at the start, uh, build, build trust relationships, prove, prove the concept. It can also be a scale-up partnership where we support to industrialize and ramp up. And, and, and um, so there, there is no one magic solution and we should stay pragmatic um, and look at what will make the, the business grow in the in the coming years. If I may add to what Gonzac said, so I want to agree, yes, equity investment is not always the best vehicle. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But that should not be the end goal. The goal really should be how do you advance in a synergistic way both missions for the for the for the two partners. Uh, and, and that means also finding who is the best partner. I mean I think um, when Gonzaga is talking about the LIDAR, they had to find who is the best partner on the LIDAR side. But that also applies to companies our size. Who is the best partner for us? Because they vary quite a bit. Every company has its own priorities, and they may or may not match what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Just uh, maybe I would like to uh, maybe open as we are reaching to the end of the time that we have here, but uh, we're not there yet. We're getting close to it. <laughs> Uh, just there's a point also that Bill brought during his presentation on the fact that we are getting 10 million uh, um, BV capacity, I mean, 10 million vehicle production capacity in BVs by the next seven to eight years, which is a, a, a lot. And we see also there's about $60 billion are invested in uh, um, uh, factories to uh, build batteries here in North America. So maybe uh, that question, I would like to start with Bill, maybe if you can just see from your point of view as, as working in the forecast and, and on those new capacities coming in, can you tell us what you see being the biggest hurdle or, or challenge or bottleneck where probably incumbents and startups need to work together on to just bring online those vehicles that we see growing in terms of, uh, of uh, number in productions, especially since the IRA kicked in? Is there anything, Bill, that you can that you see from your your perspective? Yeah, yeah. One one of the things that I that I do see is that you know with the uh, both the incumbents and the startups, we're you know we're seeing a a uh, either delays or long ramp ups in these vehicles, which which is kind of just kind of shows that they're that they're going through the the kind of the pain of of new vehicle development and, and actually launching uh and la launching these vehicles we've seen new numerous delays uh you know some some startups have actually e exited the market or actually reduced uh, uh the amount of models in their portfolio they're going to start out with uh and and there's also a question i see regarding in the in the chat here regarding capacity um, uh, I, I I presume it's it's talking about uh, uh, mostly bev bev capacity and and is there the demand uh, for that uh, if you look at our our overall North, North America production for forecast by the end of our forecast horizon we're at about 70 percent capacity utilization uh, while while we do see demand, uh, growing over that time frame, uh, there is some pressure uh, with all this capacity. I think you're going to see it come up during the uh, the UAW negotiations late, late later this year, uh, particularly uh, for example the Belvedere plant for Stellantis. Uh, still not sure what GM is going to do with their Fairfax plant. So so there's so 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 there's that question too and that risk as well uh, uh, when it comes to all this capacity coming online. Thank you. So 
uh, Gonzaga, is there anything where you see that, well, there are still a lot to accomplish because and scaling up is some a word that was popping quite regularly since the beginning, uh, that has been popping quite regularly since the beginning of that discussion. So uh, how do you see, I mean, what is the uh, uh, heavy lifting, where is it needed right now as we're multiplying by 10 the production of BVs here in North America? Um, I would say for, as I said, the, the revolution is launched and uh, we are fully convinced there will be no turnaround um, to our platform and install. And I think the, the short term challenge is rather to uh, get the talents on board, um, find the people to, to live together with us this uh, unique transformation. And um, so I, was, I wanted to share that we are celebrating this year our 100 year birthday at Valeo, and, and we are proud to, to celebrate with our partners and with our customers uh, this, this adventure delivering technology year on year in a, in a consistent manner. And to me, this is the path forward is be consistent, launch our platform according to our plan and, and embed the talents uh, that will make it happen. Thank you. Nadim, any reaction? Uh, yeah, I love the way Gonzag phrases it. The revolution has launched, which is very true. I couldn't agree in, anymore with it. But, you know, with the revolutions, also many heads get to roll. And I think over the next two years, we will get to have more flavor as to who will be the winners and who will be the losers. I think right now the whole market is absolutely being an upheaval. And companies, car makers, tier ones, tier two startups that can't react to the speed at which the market is moving, the clock at which Tesla is setting for the market, if they can't react to it, they may not be around by the end of the decade. Just building on that also, Nadim, mean, yes, I mean, there's there's need for, for speed. Uh, there's also, there will be consolidation. There are in certain areas, there's certainly too, there are too many players, uh, especially at the startup, on the st startup level. At the same time, there's another dimension to that in my mind. And that is that OEMs are integrating vertically, um, you know, in the battery space, more material, probably on the material side. Uh, but both OEMs and tier one suppliers are also boosting or creating uh, uh, software capabilities. Uh, and as they gain, you know, software, you no know, software code writing, if you will, expertise, but also the an understanding of you no know, software and match and matching software and hardware. Uh, to what extent is there a risk that uh, Incumbents can deal, can do away with startups and, and develop things on their own in, in those spaces that are today nascent, but tomorrow that would be more mature. And I guess ask the same question, same question to Gozang after that. Yeah, you know, it's a great question, Mark. And, and, I, and I personally believe that, you know, as we've grown as a company in the smartphone space, there's only one Apple. There are many Apple wannabes, but there's only one Apple because it's really, really, really hard to do everything yourself. And I think that same is going to apply to the automotive space. There's only one Tesla in the sense that the degree of vertical integration and the time that they've had to get to that point. So today, all the existing car makers, and maybe some minor exceptions, I think if I take out GM and perhaps VW, they have a certain scale that doesn't exist anywhere else. But the vast majority of other car companies just don't have the time nor the scale to replicate what Tesla did or to even try to attempt what Apple did over the last many, you know, couple of decades. So it's really hard, and they're going to be better served by creating those relationships, the partnerships, the, 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 the collaboration that Gonzaga's talking about. And ultimately, they have grown over the last couple of decades with a supply chain where they went to the tier ones for designs and capabilities. So to abolish that system overnight and becomes vertically integrated, it's a very, very tall order. Gonzaga, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think I will come out and... Um... And the challenges you were raising. So, the difference for me is not between the the new player and the the, the installed player. The difference is between those who are prepared in the train, ready, and those who are not prepared. Because for those who are not prepared, starting you now, you know, gonna be a real, real challenge. And and yes, some of the players pre pretend they will try to do everything themselves and I wish them good luck. And we know from experience that after trying, and we have seen some example in the industry, you know, the car and IT of Volkswagen is not, is not a dream. And we have several examples like that. After suffering, 
the step back and say, well, why don't we focus and look at the install player having great experience, having 12, 15 years of software behind them and, and, and let's use the product as it is and focus where we should focus. And I, I, I take the, the example of the recent partnership we, we announced between uh, BMW, Qualcomm and Valeo where well, Valeo will be delivering the parking feature. So it means the Valeo software, the parking feature will be embedded simply so that the, 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 the OEM focus on the driving, which is in itself a huge activity. So I'm, I'm fully convinced that the, the relevant products will have um, their place, will stay and will, and, and um, replacing 12 to 15 years uh, experience in the software or in a product cannot be replaced um, by the pure willingness to, to go fully in vertical. Thank you very much for that. Very interesting. So maybe we can just wrap up our discussion and open to the uh, Q&A session. So any anything that, uh, I mean, this is a vast topic. So there's probably hours, hours to talk and, and examples of failures and successes that we can, we can discuss along the way. I'm sure that IRA is accelerating also the need to uh, uh, get together as one and, and work together to deliver the best products and solutions for, for the, the customers. But maybe uh, um, uh, Gonzag, uh, Bill, Nadim, if there's any last word, any, anything important that could summarize some of the thoughts or, or, or some of the discussion that we had today before we get, we get to the uh, Q&A session? My quick final thought is we expect to see an acceleration of collaborative efforts between startup companies, tier ones, and car and vehicle makers. Thank you. And, and my, my note is uh, we spoke a lot about the, the changes in the existing passenger vehicle, but, but similarly to what's is happening in this field, this is happening to the entire mobility where EV is allowing new form of, of mobility to grow. We think too about electric scooter, three wheelers, and we see the robot taxi coming because EV is also allowing it. And, and we are fully convinced at value that the technology, the portfolio of technology we have and we are working on um, for the passenger car is very well fitted and uh, is step-by-step -step introduced into those new form of mobility. That is a, a, a continuity of this transformation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. We guess moving to Q&A. We, we, we have uh, two questions uh, in the chat. Please feel free to you know, um, get on and, and, uh, and ask your own question. Maybe we can ask uh, Jenny for us the first question, Jennifer Van Schaft, uh, if you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, sure. So I, I think uh, uh, Bill already partially answered it, but uh, my, my question was with the, the growth in manufacturing, uh, and that, that means the overall uh, automobile manufacturing uh, that we see in both the ICE and the BEV space. Uh, the growth in North America um, is, is growing quite large. And do we see that demand uh, for that growth that's coming by 2030? Uh, in, uh, or is there a reduction in global capacity happening in other parts of the world? Or are we going to go into a situation where we have overcapacity of manufacturing facilities, not, not just uh, battery manufacturing, but also the uh, automobile manufacturing? Yeah I, yeah, I was talking specifically about light vehicle automobile manufacturing, mm -hmm. but 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 yeah, like I said, it's actually a bit of both. You know, we do see overall demand increasing as we come out of this this time we are in right now, we get into more uh, recovery mode, not only in North America, uh, but also uh, globally, there is going to be some pressure on this capacity, especially the the BEV capacity uh, because of uh, capacity is not going to, uh, uh, or demand is not going to uh, match with initial capacity at, at those plants so so there is going to be some 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 pressure there and and uh and mark mentioned uh consolidation uh this could drive a consolidation of some of this capacity especially uh, uh between your incumbents and startups but i but i guess that would only be if 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 the if the startups have the uh, i guess the intellectual prop property that they would be 
interested in uh, collaborating with. Thank you, Bill, and, and thank you, Jennifer. Just a quick follow-up question on, on this one uh, to, to precise. Do we see exports uh, growing for North America? Yeah, we do. Uh, we do see them growing uh, significantly out the end, end of our forecast horizon uh, as these uh, manufacturers consolidate their, their uh, BEV operations here and they're exported uh, mainly uh, to Europe uh, with these ve vehicles. Thank you, Bill. That, that's interesting because that's also uh, a lot of questions around uh, um, talent management and knowledge of other markets, because if we need to uh, export more vehicles, it means that we need to understand also the specifications uh, for vehicles are not only built in North America, but also built in North America to be sold elsewhere. And, Maybe that's uh, a cross pollinization that is reaching to Crystal's question. So, Crystal, I invite you to open your mic and, and join us for uh, for asking your question on uh, uh, the relationships and, and the management on champions. Great. I saw that Jennifer had an awesome logo on her sweatshirt, so I immediately <laughs> pulled out my name tag. So, <laughs> hi, my name is Crystal. I'm the CEO of ESI Group. We uh, are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we have been providing uh, virtual prototyping simulation solutions to automotive principally, that's half of our revenue, but also heavy machinery and aeronautics and energy actually for the past five decades. And so I, uh, I completely understood everything Nadim was saying about these very long decades of investment of building relationships, graduating to becoming an automotive supplier, right? And the the maturity that that requires for an organization and we're also and we've been around for 50 years right and we've been pushing very pioneering you know i mean replacing tests you can touch physical tests with simulated tests and our flagship application is simulated automotive crash testing so we've really been at the forefront of inviting the automotive industry to do things very differently for quite a while and we're also experiencing that kind of change of mindset that you were describing, that there's something a little bit more open about the conversations, more risk-taking. So I, I just wanted to know, where do you think it's being encouraged the most? Where do you like to go hang out? Um, are there certain forums where it's not just as accidental, but where it's maybe more deliberately built into the forum to encourage these types of uh, relationships? Yeah, great question. And thank you for the background, Christelle. Uh, so number one, I think obviously conferences, as you refer in your note in there, you know, whether it's the SAE or uh, I find also analyst meetings to be exceptionally good because we're trying, at least from my perspective, I'm trying to touch the C-suite, the decision makers. And so where do you find those folks? And obviously sort of the SAE is one, analyst backgrounds, another one. And, and Silicon Valley tends to have a bunch of little forums like this one also that tend to be quite very beneficial in terms of establishing a, a closer personal one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion. Uh, but also we're a global company, which means going to Europe, you know, we're going to Asia. I mean, my goodness, I've, I've been to Germany I, I countless of times. I've lost count. Korea, Japan. Uh, it, there's nothing, especially for those cultures in Asia, nothing replaces the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then I think from our view, a few years ago, we started a blog, which and at the time was supposed to be just a, a, a joke, sort of like kind of a side distraction of how do we share some of our knowledge. And it's proven to be today one of the you know, a highly sought after resource. And, and we've had people to ping us from various geographies. So to say, I read this on your blog. Can you please shed some more light? And that is good enough to just initiate a conversation and take it from there. And, and lastly, you know, it, nothing, nothing can replace a bit of a cold call. I mean, sometimes when you feel someone is struggling, a company has hit a wall or they have some recalls, the batteries are on fire, you know, everybody's got a problem somewhere. They're kind of stepping in with some empathy, not just simply trying to sell your stuff, but some empathy and sort of say, look, you know, here's what we can do uh, if you're interested in cause. Uh, that, that goes very far sometimes. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Maybe uh, you know, reflecting on building on, on that is, is and maybe a bit a bit to the side. But you, uh, Nadim, you um, indicated that you work with OEMs. Your your clients are OEMs. At the same time, um, 
I'm working with lots of startups. I'm working with lots of startups both here and, and in Europe. And the question often comes in: Should I be a T1 supplier? Should I try to get there? Should I maybe partner with a a, a T1 supplier, maybe a tier two supplier, even because I don't have the scale, I don't have the credibility? Uh, should I try and build that credibility over time so that I can become a T1 supplier? Can you reflect on 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 that? You know, probably based on your experience, but also going a bit beyond because I suspect this is. No, this is a, can be an objective initially, but certainly this is not something you can just declare initially and, and trying to make happen uh, uh, as, as an immature, if you will, company. Yeah, it's a great question, Mark. And, and I don't know that I can explain that perhaps in a couple of sentences, but I think ultimately it reflects the maturity and the ambition of the organization. You can be anything you want. Okay? I mean, I remember actually when Tesla got founded and the early founders of Tesla, are, are, I, I know them very, very, very well. And, and their ambition was to just build powertrain. And then Elon Musk comes in and says, no, screw that, we're gonna actually build cars. Yeah, and so you can build anything you want. It all is a matter of, do you have the right DNA for it? Do you have the right ambitions for it? Do you have the right skills? Do you have the right team? Do you have the right maturity? And for us at Qnovo, we made a decision that we're gonna be a tier one software supplier. And that's sort of a category that we believe can we win in. And then sort of we made great progress in that respect and we are winning. But I wouldn't say, let me go be a generalized tier one supplier. That's not where I want to go. That's not where our ambitions are. That's not where our skill sets are. And that's not where the market is guiding us to be. And so I think every company has to look deep into its DNA and its ambitions and maturity and sort of say, do I have a path? And by the way, the capital that you need, I mean, you have to sort of understand to go from point A to point B, what capital do I need? If I want to go build cars, I'm going to need tens of billions, perhaps even more than that. But if I want to be a software tier one supplier, that could be perhaps on the hundreds of millions. So all of those will map into who are your investors, who are your supporters, who are your capital providers to help you go from point A to point B. So long answer, very complex answer, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of, of some of the challenges and defining what you want to be when you grow up. Right? Yeah. And maybe goes like maybe your your echo on that. I mean, you because you obviously as a twenty billion dollar or euro uh, T one supplier, you see companies that does you know million dollars in ARR uh, as being obviously peanuts, but potentially a partner, a competitor, uh, you know, someone that has the speed, that has the agility uh, to you know take your place in certain very you know in narrow uh, with narrow bandwidth, but certainly very uh, uh, relevant there. How do you see that? Competition or co competition potentially? We started um, from Gonzaga. I'm sorry, no, sorry. The, yeah, yeah. The, there's oh. nothing, there's nothing more flattering than competition. Absolutely. I love competition because in the early days of, of Kinova, when we went to the car makers and they'd say, All right, we know we're doing X, Y, and Z, and they say, Oh, who's your competition? And, you know, back in 2010, 2012, we had no competition. But there was no market either. So it was sort of self-defeating to sort of say, I have no competition because no one cared. 100% of zero is not much. Right. And so today it's different. I love competition. And it really, I love the fact that we are always two steps ahead of them. I think ultimately the transformation is so vast and so deep that not one single entity can do it independently. And so it will become collaboration. When the market begins to mature, probably in the 30s, then we're going to start seeing more segmentation, fragmentation, and competition. But until then, I think all hands on deck are going to be important. Yeah. And Gonzaga, like your take on that collaboration, competition with startups? I think uh, we, we view ourselves as the technology provider for any mobility provider, right? From shuttle buses, passenger car. So I then, of course, we work and we rework every day on our technology platform to to differentiate them and to and to make them unique so that there is a unique appeal. So uh, they, we are not afraid uh, of competition, as I said, and this can be a competition sometimes, partnership sometimes. I think there is no even not one unique shem with uh, one players where it could be a competitor for one of its portfolio and a partner, a go-to-market partner on, on another. So uh, the, the, the the growth of product and means in the coming years is so huge that uh, there is there is a, a room for development and uh, and we have no fear to. I mean, to compete, having our, I mean, a focus, a deep focus on our product and platform, a unique selling point. Thank you, Gonzaga. And beyond the, the selling point, also more internally, how do you see, what, what are the critical elements, maybe not just Valeo, but as an incumbent, uh, what are 
a critical element that are necessary to uh, validate or integrate more quickly an innovation or on, on an organic or inorganic perspective? So I would say we have a few, we have a few tools, uh, we have a few tools uh, at first to, to identify potential partners, to pre-qualify them and to give them direct access to, to the right guy. And I think in complex organization like, like uh, 100, 3,000 people um, at Valio, uh, it's hard to give the direct access to the key person that in, within a one hour of call will be able to know and to feel right. Either, either uh, product valuables, can I establish trust with this person? And uh, what are the, do we have a short term market or short term activity to do? So we, we have this, uh, let's say, evaluation kill tool that I view as a key asset to, to be able to go fast. Thank you. All right. Other questions around the table? Don't hesitate to uh, open your mic and raise your voice. Uh, yes. Hi, this is Marguerite. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Nadim, learning how to scale. And I don't know about this. I'd be, you know, I'm curious if you can uh, just give a just brush off how to scale based on your experience. Yeah, great question. And I think my team and I have We've talked about it at length, perhaps infinitum, and and because we're going through this right now, how do you go from servicing you know a handful of customers to many more customers? How do you go from servicing one or two vehicle models to now many many more vehicle models? And that sort of really has a bunch of things in it. One, of course, how do you become a credible supplier? How do you establish credibility in the vis-a-vis -vis of not only just one vehicle maker, one customer, but across many of them? And that implies processes, maturity of the team, maturity of our compliances mature to our product, mature to our innovation steps, all of that has to be in place where the customer looks at you and sort of says, yeah, I think I can trust you. These vehicles and the products are not in there for one or two years. They're going to be in the vehicle for years to come, often 10, 15 years. So how do you get that credibility across? Second, how do you scale physically on the ground to be near the customers? There's a tremendous amount of handholding that is required. I mean, I think back to the earlier question that Mark was saying, you know, will they do it themselves? And I can tell you with fairly good confidence they can't because the amount of handholding we do at this point in time does not lend itself to that point. And that means we got to put resources on the ground, competent resources on the ground. So that creates a whole issues around hiring and, and training and retention, et cetera, uh, globally, not only just in one place. Uh, the automotive, we're talking here particularly about Detroit and Silicon Valley, but the nature of the automotive space, it is global. You know, uh, Valeo is a French company with U.S., significant US presence, significant Asian presence, and how do we apply to all, all of them? So how do we become more global? How do we operate globally uh, across multiple time zones? And that's another segment of scaling. And now, fortunately, we're software companies, so I can't speak much of a supply chain for us, but we do extensive battery testing. So how do we scale our testing capabilities? We're perhaps one of the most sophisticated testing uh, when we swim in data. So how do you scale your ability to collect data how do you scale across protecting the data across different customers? You can't take data from customer A and then somehow have customer B see that. So all those protections, security all had to be in place. So, and I can probably go on and on, but that gives you a flavor, Margot, of some of the things that I wanted to think about, right? And ultimately, really, at the end of the day, scaling in my mind always boils down to team, to bringing on board people who are qualified, who share the same passion, and understand what is the task on hand because you know, startup companies come out of the mode where you know we do everything from being CEO to taking the trash out. And as you scale, you can't keep doing that anymore. You need to divide and conquer and make sure you've got the right people on board to do the right tasks. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? If not, maybe Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel will conclude. Well, um, I think most of it has been said by uh, amazing speakers. So um, I would just like to thank everyone. I would just like to say that uh, 
we're very happy, I think, Nadim and myself, that the, our internet connection managed to stay on because you may not all be aware, but we're having a, a massive windy storm right now outside our windows. We don't live far away, but it's been quite impressive throughout the, the panel. So I'm glad that we could stay, both stay on. Um, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you to the panelists for uh, taking uh, some of their time to, uh, to be with us and share their insights. Um, our um, mobility committees, whether it's for the Michigan chapter or ourselves in San Francisco are pretty active and uh, we try to have some more sessions around this uh, bridging the gap. Uh, hopefully we'll keep you posted, but uh, we're hoping to have several of these uh, throughout the year. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you very much.